We're here in Sorrento, Florida to talk to Bill Bradshaw. I know you were born in Georgia, and I know you attended Stetson University. Tell us about that journey. Well, it's interesting. Uh, from Cartersville, Georgia, uh, I was picked to be in the band because I raised my hand, and the director said, let me see your teeth. And so I showed him, and he said, okay, you'll play trumpet. That's a very scientific way to start my band program. But uh, in, in Cartersville, I had two very influential band directors. One of them was Boyd McCowan. Boyd then went on down to Marietta, I think, and was president of GMEA and big, big, big icon in uh, band work in Georgia and all over. And the other one that probably is the main reason I went into music as a profession was Dale Rush. Dale uh, had taught in Georgia forever, and then uh, after I was teaching, Dale moved to Florida and became part of FBA and taught in the New Smyrna area for a while. So those two guys really helped uh, point me into a music uh, career. Uh, of course, my father told me I was going to starve to death, but uh, <laughs> that's what fathers do, I think. But anyway, uh, Stetson University was a long way from Cartersville, and that's what I was looking for. And uh, came down, auditioned for Don Yaxley, who was the brass teacher there, uh, got a scholarship, and uh, Don Yaxley taught me everything that I know about teaching brass instruments and wind instruments. Uh, the band director there was Richard Fiesel. Uh, very, very good job and, and a big influence on my life. And so uh, Stetson was a, a, a great time for four years. Met my wife there. She's also a musician. And so uh, we got married when we finished Stetson. I went to Indiana University and uh, worked on my master's, finished my master's there. Had a master in trumpet uh, with a minor in conducting and uh, was a teaching assistant. I had a grad assistantship there where I was able to teach some college level students. Studied with Louis Davidson, who was former principal trumpet with the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra and just really, really enjoyed my playing time there. But uh, we decided we didn't want to live in the cold weather anymore. So my <laughs> wife, who is a Florida native from Umatilla, uh, we came we came back south to Florida to, to live. And so the, that's how we got back to Florida. And uh, it's interesting, if you want me to, tell you a little bit about how I got at Apopka High School. Yes, we'd certainly uh, like to hear that. I uh, was waiting to hear about a college job and uh, time was growing short, and so I figured, hey, I need to get some money coming in. <laughs> so I went down and was hired by the Florida Symphony Orchestra to play with the orchestra, and its season was only 32 weeks, I think, at the time, and that wasn't enough money to live on all year, so I figured, man, I gotta find a band director's job. And there weren't any, this was August, it was late, and people had already started band camps and everything else. And uh, fortunately, uh, Apopka High School was open because the principal didn't know his band director had left. And so he was frantically looking for a band director. That may be the only reason they hired me because he was desperate. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, uh, ended up in, in Apopka and uh, there and playing with the Florida Symphony. And I told uh, Mr. Williams, Roger Williams, who was the principal, I said, uh, you know, I have responsibilities with the orchestra in the mornings, like for kitty concerts and stuff that we do at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know how I'm going to work that out. And he said, well, it'll be good publicity for the school and community for you to do that. So he says, can your wife cover your classes? And I said, well, yeah, I had, uh, it was a 7 through 12 school, so I had 7th and 8th grade in the morning. And they were beginning bands mainly. And so my wife also, who is a pianist, became a band director for, <laughs> for the time that I needed to get covered while I was away playing with the orchestra in the morning. So we, we enjoyed spending all of our teaching years in Apopka. It was, it was a great experience for us. And how many years were you at Apopka? I was 20 years at Apopka and uh, 
greatly influenced by the directors around. Um, I've, I found out that musically I was ready to teach. Being a band director is something totally different. It's not just teaching notes <laughs> and lines and spaces. Uh, you have to be a myriad of things as well as a psychologist and a surrogate parent and everything else. But uh, it, it was it was a great experience, and I had people to look at that were close by that helped guide me and teach me and let me know the things I needed to do. One was Del Kiefner. Another one was Jack Williams at Winter Park High School. Chief Wilson at Jones. Uh, just some, some great directors around. And uh, they were kind enough to take me under their wings, so I appreciated that. And after a few years, I actually figured out what I needed to do as a band director. <laughs> well, once you finished Apopka High School, you didn't leave Apopka and you didn't leave music. Where was your next position? Well, I, I had been doing music bivocationally at uh, Trinity Baptist Church in Apopka. And they have a private school there, and they offered me a full-time position. Please come and take over, you know, the school and start a program here for us. And I turned them down three or four times, and they finally made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> so I left uh, the high school in 1986 and went full-time at Trinity Baptist Church as a school administrator and started a band program there, which, by the way, is still involved with FBA. And my daughter, Edie, is uh, teaching that band program at Trinity still. But uh, the next 30 years we spent at Trinity and uh, did the choir and the orchestra and developed a, a really good orchestra for the church. And the choir grew. and, and we were able to do pretty much what we wanted to do. So we've stayed involved in the city of Apopka from the time we arrived there mm -hmm. until now. That's fantastic. What challenges did you encounter as a band director? Well, just knowing what to do to start with was a challenge. Uh, you, don't, you don't learn how to pass out uniforms you don't learn how to, you, know, you, you there's so many things that you don't know and all of a sudden you have to do that. And so uh, the learning experience in the first year of teaching was, was it was formidable. And uh, then we went through a period uh, of integration, which everybody in those days experienced where they would just close black schools and send them all to the white schools. We were fortunate that we had strong leadership uh, from our principal and uh, he just didn't have any racial problems. He handled them very well. We didn't have any problems like that. And so it, it was a challenge, and all the teachers were actually scared about what was going to happen uh, when, when that took place. But uh, because of the leadership of the administration, uh, we had no problems, and, and it worked out good now when we would take the band someplace out of town and had a number of minority students in it then. Uh, the, some of the parents were reluctant to let the kids go to some of these communities that had a reputation of not being receptive to minorities. And so uh, we would have to tell the parents, look, you know, we'll take care of your kid, don't worry about it. And so we, we grew through that and uh, the program developed, it got large, and uh, we, we, we really enjoyed from then on teaching uh, without any turmoil. It was just a matter of teaching and enjoying watching the students accomplish things that, that sometimes you didn't think they could. Fantastic. What about some pivotal moments that brought you musical success? Well, one that, that sticks in the mind of, of all of our students of that time and everything else uh, was that we auditioned to go to the International Youth and Music Festival in Vienna, Austria. And we were selected to go there, and it was during our bicentennial, 1976. Had a good band, had a large band. We had just made superior at state contest uh, that year. 
and uh, so we uh, were looking forward to going and so that was really a high point we we were able to work with dr william ravelli who uh, had of course uh, the reputation of being like the number one band guy in the world i guess but he was the conductor of the mass band programs and well, we were fortunate enough for him to come to apopka and rehearse our band and get us ready to be part of of, uh, of the international youth and music festival and uh, when we got there we did just four or five concerts a day it was it was incredible we performed at our military bases there our american military bases and it was interesting uh, at the one base in heidelberg which is a big army base uh, they didn't want a concert. They wanted a halftime show. Oh. They wanted to see the band marching. They had a football field and it was lined off. So we did a halftime show for them. Uh, I think really all they wanted to do was look at the majorettes. I don't <laughs> think they were interested in the band too much. They just wanted to watch our majorettes. But we did concerts around Austria. And uh, one of the interesting things that, that happened there, and this is a story that we'll include, uh, we were doing a stand-up concert in a in a town out from a town that had smuggled american flyers who had been shot down behind german lines back to uh, allied lines and they wanted an american band <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> my voice went away um, they wanted an american band to to play and so we were doing a stand-up concert and we were playing and i noticed that the crowd just kept pressing in closer and closer and closer to the band until they could just reach out and touch, uh, which they did. <laughs> Our minority, we had some minority students in the clarinet section right on the outside there, and people would walk up and rub their skin and feel their afros. Afros were in then, so they all had their big afros going for them. And our black students were really getting upset about it. They were, they were taking offense to that. And the Austrian president uh, was there as a speaker at this event. And he came over and he said, may I speak to your students? And I said, well, of course, you know, please. And he explained to the students that there were no minorities, no black students, no black people that lived anywhere around there and that my minority students were the first ones that these people had seen. And they rubbed their arm because they wanted to see if they were chimney sweeps and it would rub off, the soot would rub off. And of course the afros were just so intriguing they couldn't help but do that. But then our kids understood that it meant no disrespect. So they became stars and then they wanted to show <laughs> off everything. You want to rub my skin? You know, you want to feel my fro? But that was a learning experience for them as well as for me and, and for all of our parents that were along as chaperones and our administrators that were there. I had like two or three principals that were with us uh, that, that saw a learning experience take place before their eyes that uh, stays with them till this day. I still have kids this many years later talk about that event. But our, our kids came home with a new appreciation for America and what America stood for because they found out, as one of my, one of my uh, black trumpet players said, Mr. B, there ain't no brothers over there. And so that, that was a, a statement that stayed with him. But that was a high point for us to be able to travel Europe for three weeks and play 100, I mean, it seemed like 100 concerts. I'm sure it wasn't. But we had a great time, and it was a life-changing experience for 150 kids. Wow. Wow. What about words of wisdom or advice that you could pass on to young and future directors? The one thing you need to do is find the directors around you that have been your way before. They've, they've fought the battles that you're fighting, and they know things that they can tell you that will help you. So don't be an island to yourself. Make sure you go to these other directors and seek out their knowledge and ask them because they'll, they'll share with you. As I related earlier, there, there were so many directors 
that helped me and and uh, without those i could not have been successful uh, i i know like the ones i mentioned plus tom bishop uh, re remains sharp in my memory and bob lampy who was uh, the executive secretary of Florida Bandmasters Association. He had scared the bejesus out of you if he was judging, but uh, <laughs> he was a dear friend, a, a really good friend. So I, my, my, my advice would be look for help. Go to these people that know what they're doing and, and glean from them the things that they've learned. And for yourself, set a good moral example for your students to follow. Uh, be be not their friend only, but their teacher and, and disciplinarian, because it's necessary. But uh, your example for them will be the greatest thing that you can pass on to them. That's really great advice. Is there something about your personal character that you would say enabled you to achieve your high level of musical excellence? Uh, determination uh, from all the teachers that I had in trumpet uh, they instill in you the desire to be as good as you could be and to just work and work and work and if you had to practice seven hours a day you practice seven hours a day and so that example carried over to all my students uh, we we expected good things from them we demanded high performance levels from them and and made them believe that they could do that. And many times they would surprise you and even surpass what you had hoped they would do. So those, those are things. And again, the good moral character, that's important. Um, I know with my band, we did not have a bunch of rules and demerits and everything else. My one rule with the kids is if you're thinking about doing something and there's any question in your mind whether you should do it or not, then you don't do it. It's just that simple, and that keeps you out of trouble, <laughs> you know, and it worked fine for us, and that, those are the things that I think are important. All right. What did you do during your teaching career to keep the edge? I was playing with the Florida Symphony, which made me be on top of my game. Uh, when Walt Disney World opened, uh, I, I did some playing there. I was a show coordinator for them, working with their student musicians, their bands that they would bring in. So that required that I stay on top of my game as well as just teaching. So uh, those experiences were not only good for me, but they were good for my students because I passed on those things to them. And they were aware of your... Uh, professional performance. Oh yeah, oh yeah. They they kept up with what I was doing and where, and I was able to hire a lot of them for Disney, for special events at Christmas time. We'd we'd have they'd let me hire a brass choir, and most of them were my students. We'd audition. Some of them came from other schools, but uh, it gave my kids an opportunity to be part of that experience and make some money at it too. And uh, so it was good for them uh, that I had an association with Disney, and uh, and they they profited from it also. <laughs> now that you're retired, what do you do to keep the creative juices flowing? Still playing, uh, still doing concerts, still singing concerts, but uh, play in our church orchestra now. Uh, and, and my wife and I both uh, perform with them every Sunday, every week. And uh, that, that keeps me playing enough that I have some chops left. Not, <laughs> not a whole lot, but some. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're still actively involved in the community and in Central Florida uh, musically in a lot of ways. Well, you already told us the story about going to Europe. Do you have another short story that could demonstrate some the satisfaction you've had in choosing the life of a band director? I, it's not just a story, but it's it's seeing students accomplish things in their life. Uh, you work with them, you teach them, you try to help them grow up, 
And kids are kids, no matter where you go, and they're going to do kid things. <laughs> and sometimes you have to really sit on them hard. And I have uh, one young man in mind who was a, a fine trumpet player, and uh, he he was hanging out with the wrong people and everything else. And I had to just get on him hard and sit down and tell him, hey, look, are you going to be like a gang member the rest of your life? Or are you going to do something? You're going to make something out of yourself. And uh, not long ago, I had a man come back to me at Trinity and he handed me a business card and he said, this doctor did my heart surgery, my open heart surgery. And it was this trumpet player. It was wow. this boy. He is now a heart surgeon. And uh, he had sent me his card to let me know how much he appreciated me helping him grow up. So those are the kind of things that, that uh, are important to me and the things that I'll remember. That's fantastic. I've really enjoyed spending time with you, learning some new things, and enjoying your stories. It's time for us to finish up, so it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks for coming our way and letting me talk to you for a while. <laughs>